In January 2019, Dr. William Husell, an intensive care physician at Mount Carmel Health System in Ohio, was accused of ending the lives of 34 patients by ordering excessively high doses of fentanyl over the course of four years from 2015 to 2018. The patients ranged in age, gender, and reason for being in the intensive care unit, but they all had one thing in common. All of the patients were receiving end-of-life care and were provided abnormally high doses of fentanyl prior to palliative extubation. After the hospital received numerous complaints and lawsuits from the deceased patient's family members that they felt like the medication dosing hastened their loved one's passing, Dr. Husel was charged with murder and was let go from Mount Carmel Health System. A murder trial ensued, taking place in March and April 2022, with the jury declaring him not guilty on all counts in late April 2022. To this day, Dr. Husel maintains his innocence, stating that if he knew then what he knows now, he would not change his treatment choices and that he felt the dosing was appropriate for his patients. Why did he think these deadly doses were okay to be given, especially when they go against every guideline available? How was he able to do this time and time again without being reported? Who else is at fault for these alleged murders? And what can we learn from this? Let's dive into it. All right, welcome to today's stream. If you're new here, I'm Liz. I am a family nurse practitioner. And on this channel, I like to talk about healthcare and healthcare related things and hopefully make them understandable to everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about the Dr. William Husel case in which he allegedly, we have to say alleged because this case has actually been, it, you know, they've voted on it and they've decided he's not guilty, spoilers. Um, but allegedly he killed 37 people and um, was found innocent. So what had happened was between 2015 and 2018, Dr. William Husel is a physician. He is the only physician on night shift at Mount Carmel Hospital in the ICU. And he gave the patients an incredibly high dose of fentanyl um, and 37 of them died. Now, the hospital didn't really do anything about this, which was quite mind blowing. If you think about it, you know, you keep seeing this pattern where we have a patient and then they, this healthcare provider in the middle of the night gives them, them this wildly high dose of an opiate and then they pass away. You would think that someone would look at that and be like, this is an odd pattern. No, no one did this. Um, we move on years pass, right? And this keeps happening in 2018, finally in October, They've realized that they're getting sued enough that uh, a formal complaint is filed. And they say, hey, um, <laughs> this keeps happening. What, what is exactly going on here? We would like to look into this. I don't know if that is when CMS, which is Center for Medicaid Services, is informed. But um, everyone is starting to get notified here. And they're like, wow, that's like a lot of lawsuits. Let's do something about it. So they start a formal investigation in October. Um, and then in more people keep dying in November is when the hospital finally says, you know what? Three more people, by the way, between October and November have passed away in the exact same way by the exact same position. And they say, this is all like, we're going to have you just stop practicing for the moment while we figure this out. They report him, um, the hospital reports him to the medical board um, and they begin to look into it. Um, this is when Mount Carmel also starts to panic and they go, oh my gosh, as they're looking into it, all of these people have died. We have done a big oopsie. What is happening here? And they start to fire people. They fire, um, in the end, they end up firing like their CEO. They fire their, uh, a bunch of nurses, a bunch of pharmacists. Um, they start to contact the, um, families and they're like, Hey, this might've happened. And I'm really sorry. And it just kind of keeps on going until, um, January when they want, um, the CMS basically comes down and the center CMS is centers for Medicare and Medicaid services. And they're the ones that pay the hospitals through like Medicare and Medicaid. So they have a lot of money that the hospitals really enjoy having. And, um, they said, we're not going to pay you unless you figure this ish out. And that is when the hospital came out and said like, okay, we're actually going to try to fix this. Here's our safety plan. Um, oh yeah, by the way, he's getting uh, filed criminal filings against him. So we're going to charge him for murder. We we admitted that maybe this is weird. Um, they bring the murder charges against him. 
implement their 10 steps, fire like half the unit and off we go, right? Mark Carmel's like, all right, that's done. Still getting a bunch of lawsuits, but at least we can move on from this, right? Um, they, in the end, there were some places say 34, some places say 35 patients that ended up being affected and tragically their lives were ended in this way. Um, and I do want to say that just like a disclaimer, we're talking about this so we can learn from it, not so that we can try to like center the conversation on anyone other than the families, obviously for the families and the patients, this is absolutely devastating and horrifying. Um, and this is not to in any way diminish that it's to make things safer so that this doesn't happen to more people. Um, so all of this kind of just, you know, sits here and then we have a pandemic. Um, and then this is brought to court in March of 2022. So very recently, and they had a ton of witnesses. They had all the family members, they came forward and they said, this is what happened. Uh, they had nurses testifying. They had everybody testifying. They had one anesthesiologist counter testify. So like be the one to kind of talk about it and say, Hey, no, this is why he's actually totally fine. And then the jury voted and they said, Oh, he didn't do it. That's totally fine. They were charging him with murder and um, later dropped the charges to attempted murder to try to make it less heinous. Um, and the jury was like, you know what? No, no, he is not guilty. Um, and, you know, the rest of everyone is like, WTF mate. So that's kind of the brief synopsis. I had done a poll over on YouTube and it looked like 63% of you did not know what this was. So Again, that's why we're talking about it. Also, I would like to preface this conversation by, um, you know, we're going to go and we're going to look at a lot of different questions I've had about the case. We're going to explain things that might not be in general known about as we go through it. Um, and I would love, I would love any input, any insights that I have from some of you. I've had several conversations with some ICU nurses over on Instagram because my background is not ICU. I have done a lot, a lot, a lot of end of life care a lot of comfort care, but not from a ICU standpoint. So if you have that perspective, I would love to hear it either now in the chat or later in the comments. I appreciate you. Also, if you like this type of thing, you know, do the likey subscribey thing so that the YouTube gods are happy, um, which in turn makes me happy. So thanks friends. Okay. So if you have any questions that you have about this case in general, by all means, leave them in the chat and we can talk about them. I have a list, but my list is obviously like not super conclusive. I did get it over from Instagram. So if you ever want to be more involved in these types of discussions, you can always go over there. It's I'm.nurse.liz. Um, and that's where we have a lot of chit chatty and I get a lot of my questions and stuff from you. So let us start with what is the similarities? Like what is a general similar thing about all of these deaths, right? Okay. So, um, they all were, so there were a lot of differences about the patients. It wasn't like this was like one diagnosis where like, maybe he's just really bad at treating pneumonia. The thing that unified all of these patients where they were all being palliatively extubated. So what that means is they had decided their families had basically decided they had had a conversation with the healthcare providers who said, Hey, you are no, no, you are not going to get better. You are on life support. So you're on a ventilator. You know, they might be on dialysis and all these other things. And they said, we're going to take you off of the ventilator, but we do not expect you to recover. So that's called palliative extubation. Now, when someone is palliatively extubated, you can live for anywhere from like, not really anything at all. Like, you know, you come off the vent and you never breathe on your own again. Or, you know, some people live, and again, this is where ICU nurses come and let me know. But from what my understanding is, is, you know, minutes, hours, and in some cases, even days, it really depends on the underlying what is going on um, in the, uh, in the situation. But that is the situ like that is the event that everything was going on with all of these patients is they were all at the end of their treatment plan. And now it was switching over to, hey, um, you know, we're going to be extubating you. We do not expect you to recover. So the patients were all at the end of their life. Um, the pair, the pair, the, 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 the I almost said parents because I worked in peds, so it would be parents, P the patient's families all had these real adults, by the way, ranging mostly elderly. However, there were some like very young patients. Um, the patient's families had all agreed to palliative care. However, um, they did not, um, they did not agree. And they all said like, yes, let's have them extubated. They did feel rushed in some cases to have this happen, but they did not agree to like 
oh, please give my mom like this mega dose of anything. That's not how it went. Um, they actually, the fentanyl that was ordered is very typical for these cases. This is normal. Um, when you are taking someone off of a ventilator and doing uh, any kind of like extubation like that, or even just an end of life in general, one of the symptoms that um, you can experience is called air hunger. And it's because your body's shutting down. You're not ventilating and breathing very well. So you feel very, very short of breath, which is very anxiety inducing and it's very uncomfortable. So one of the things that is often given is uh, an opiate. So morphine is very common. Um, fentanyl is another one that's very common. And this really helps to calm down the patient and it reduces the brains. Um, it actually like, tricks the brain into, it decreases the need to kind of respirate and the panic around that. So it makes people much more comfortable. So the fact that he gave fentanyl and extubation is not abnormal. It's the amount as we will discuss. So, um, the patient's families, again, they weren't, and this is what makes the case tricky is the patient's families knew they were likely going to pass. And the patient's families had given permission to like, Hey, we're not going to treat anymore. We're going to make them comfortable. However, like I said, they really didn't expect that this insane dose was going to be given. Um, opiates like fentanyl and morphine are going to one, it's going to cause you to not feel short of breath, but they're also going to slow down your respiratory drive at the same time. So, these medications while they're given at the end of life, um, you know, sometimes they can hasten things like if you, you know, if you were going to pass, but it might not have been quite as soon in the, in order to have someone be comfortable, you would give it, even though, you know, it's going to slow their breathing down. Um, Emily Martinez is a ICU nurse and she can't wait to hear more. She's done lots of palliative extubation. So Emily, you don't know it, but you've just become my resource. Okay. Ready? Great. Set. Go. Um, so that setting that around it, like this is not a case where he is doing something egregious, right? He's just doing an insane amount of it is basically what I'm trying to get across. Okay. So, um, other thing to note is usually on comfort care dosing around opiates is very generous. So you hear a lot about, um, you know, oh, people withholding opiates for pain medication in palliative care, which is when we're trying to make people comfortable at the end of their life, that goes out the window a little, and that is going to play a big part in the rest of this case as we go forward. So just like tuck that in the back of your mind. Okay. So, now that we kind of know what is the same about all these deaths is all of these patients were being palliatively extubated. Um, we can look at what is fentanyl really quick. So fentanyl, fentanyl is a very, very potent. You're going to hear my dog barking. I, she's alerting us of something. Um, fentanyl is a very potent opiate. So opiates are things that are going to be like morphine, um, you know, usually used for pain medication. Um, a little goes a long way. I, this is where, uh, if you work in the ICU and you, or, or you prescribe this, do let me know. Um, fentanyl, uh, I gave morphine all the time, either IV or under the tongue, like sublingually for my patients who are passing away. I can see how fentanyl would be beneficial because it's very short acting. So if you just wanted to kind of give it to get someone through extubation, it would wear off pretty quickly. Um, that being said, a little goes a very long way, right? Um, it, it's very, very potent. Also, um, who said, Kate, thanks for the super chat. Dr. Husel's behavior is dangerous. Old nurse here. I agree. <laughs> very much agree. Um, yeah, it was, and it's just going to get more terrifying as we go on. Um, so the normal dosing of this medicine, since it is very potent is about 50 to hundred micrograms, right? Okay. So very, very little dose. I drew us a chart. Um, the dose range per guidelines is like here, like 50 to hundred, give it a lot in the PACU. Like after someone has gone to the OR, I've given fentanyl a lot of times, 50 to hundred micrograms. Um, not this Dr. Husall was giving 400 to 2000 micrograms. 400 to 2000. So just look at our graph and be like, here are the guidelines. The guidelines are like what all the people who have looked at all the research said, this will be fine. And then this is what he was giving. And that is where we get into trouble, right friends? Um, so <laughs> it was not the med. It was the way you chose to order the med, sir, that we all have a little bit of a problem with. Um, cause his doses were 400 to 2000 micrograms, which would not even be orderable in a computer. Um, so could this have been 
on accident. Oh, I have to put my banner up that way. When I go back to timestamp it, I think we missed a few. Um, then it makes it a little, a little bit easier. Where is my house fentanyl used? Oh, oh, good. We got it. Okay. Could this have been an accident? This is going to help me later. So if you're watching this on the replay, <laughs> I can timestamp it for you and you don't have to watch me trying to figure it out. Um, could this have been an accident? No. Um, <laughs> TLDR. No. Uh, could it have happened once? Yes. And been an accident? Absolutely. It gets kind of complicated when you have, um, you know, micrograms. This is a common thing that can be mixed up in healthcare is when you're dealing with so many zeros. So the dose being like, 50 to 100, you could accidentally add a zero. And this happens with all types of things. Uh, and a horrible thing could happen, right? We've seen horrible med, med accidents happen, but if it happens 34 times and you have seen the outcome, that's not an accident. That is willful negligence. Emily Martinez. Yes, it was the highest single dose was a thousand micrograms, but it was given two of them were given 20 minutes apart. So the patient got within, I think, 20 minutes, 2000 micrograms of fentanyl, but he was giving doses of 400 to a thousand on a regular basis in one dose, which, um, so Emily brings up a good point going back to the fentanyl. It's not uncommon since fentanyl wears off so quickly to frequently dose little doses, you know, little here, little here, little here, little here repeating, but all at once, it's just going to tell your brain like, good night. We don't need to breathe. We're, where's this fine? So once could it have been an accident where you added an extra zero? Yeah, sure. Um, could it happen 34 times? No, unless you have selective amnesia and you have no short-term memory, in which case this is probably not going to be the job for you. Um, so he ordered these. Another thing that is um, shocking with this is he ordered the medication on override. So typically if you were palliatively extubating someone, I would expect this would not be an emergency, right? Um, maybe in the case of like, oh, you desperately needed a bed or something. But even then, things like this are usually handled fairly decorate, um, fairly de delicately. He claimed that in the middle of the night, they needed to be emergently extubated. So therefore he didn't, a lot of the times he was giving a verbal order to write these immense amounts of medication, um, saying, Hey, go pull this, let's give this so we can extubate them. So it never went into the computer, never had to type it in, which means pharmacy didn't have to look at it before it was given to the patient. So that's a huge red flag. And that is not an oops. That's maybe an oops once again, but it's bypassing all of the safety things, which if you do that, like 34 times, that's no longer an error or an emergency. That is, what are you doing? Like that's insanity. Um, another thing that in terms of implementing, giving the medicine, which I actually see the chat talking about, um, is how many ampules this would be, because if this was an accident, like you have in a vial, I think it's a hundred micrograms. Let me see if, okay, perfect. DW said a hundred micrograms per vial. If you're giving 10 vials of a medicine, like that should just give anyone pause. You know, if you're ordering it and someone comes up and they're like, I've got like, you know, and you're holding it in like a, like, like, look at my baggie of dose of medicine. That should be an epic warning that should be something that nurses are also like that other people are talking about. You know, if this was happening on the unit, it would be something to discuss. Like I wouldn't get an order for a thousand micrograms of fentanyl and not like tell someone else and be like, did you, did you see this order? Like <laughs> that, that just wouldn't happen. So no, I don't think it was an accident. This was quite well informed. And there were a lot of other people that, um, likely knew about this. So um, <laughs> yeah, so palliative, um, extubations are always timed mom and nurse, uh, typically make sure your family is there and ready. Exactly. So again, going back to, he's claiming that these were emergencies that he needed to like, that's why he couldn't enter the information into the computer, but a palliative, um, palliative or an intubation. Yes. Oh, someone can't breathe. Let's put a tube down their throat and help them breathe. But to remove that, that's not an emergent event, right? You want your family to be there. You want the patient's families to be able to say goodbye. You want it to be a kind of a peaceful time. I, we, a lot of, um, at least in my hospital, some nurses I talked to, they said they did palliatively extubate at night because it was just quieter. 
but it wasn't emergent. So there's no reason why you couldn't get the medicine into the computer and, and have it verified. And this is likely something that you know is going to happen quite a bit beforehand. And it's not a surprise a lot of the times at this point. Um, this is something that's been going on for a couple of different days. Um, Lenoka said, shouldn't the facility red flag those high doses and require secondary approval? One would think, um, but it took them like 31 times until they did that. So that took until October of 2018. And, um, then they started to look into it, but it happened three more times between when they looked into it. And when they said, you, you probably shouldn't work here anymore. So they did look at it. Um, Elliot asked, do you know if these patients were opiate tolerant or naive? So, uh, some of them, so there were a lot of different patients. Some of them, they said were probably more opiate tolerant. Um, however, a single dose still, they said, even in, you know, they brought in other expert witnesses who said, even in the most opiate tolerant person, a thousand micrograms is going to tell your brain, Hey, stop breathing. It's all fine. Um, in case you aren't familiar, some patients, um, especially with fentanyl, the more you have of it, the more you can then have next time. So like if someone wears a uh, prime working in primary care, we had a lot of patients with fentanyl patches, um, or like not a lot, we had some, and if you've had a lot of exposure to opiates before you can wear a fentanyl patch, but if you haven't putting one on will kill you. So that's kind of where that's coming from is I think people were like, oh, well, maybe they were all really used to this. So he thought that would be fine, but they found that there were some people who were really opiate naive, which is they have not had a lot of opiates. Um, so it doesn't make sense. Uh, mom and her said the IV push max on fentanyl she's ever given is 200 micrograms. And that is typically the point when patient is in distress. Yes. So, um, uh, 200 is, uh, 200 is more than I think I've given. Nope. I've given a hundred. I've never given more than hundred. Um, so giving 200 would be a lot. And remember we're talking like 400 to 2000. So Yikers. Um, and in distress would either would most likely be from like pain because it acts really quickly and is great for pain um right after. So um no, not on accident. There we are. Next, who else could really be at fault here, right? Um, because how, like a lot of you are saying, did we get to the point where um this has been going on for so long and uh it's just allowed to keep going. Um, so turns out at this hospital, um, it's, it's very much on him. I'm not trying to shimmy the blame away from anyone, but this points to once again, a systemic issue because things rarely happen in a vacuum as we have learned. So, uh, I was like, how, like you, I was like, how, how was this allowed to happen? Um, if an opiate or a benzo was ordered at this hospital, there were only two pharmacists for the whole hospital in more, well supplied hospitals. Um, you usually have a pharmacist that only works for the ICUs. And that is because, uh, you, they order a lot more medicine. So you have one dedicated and they can get stuff stat a lot easier. Um, this one didn't have that. So they just had two pharmacists for the whole thing. And so they said that, if you ordered something like an opiate or a benzo, it was likely that it wasn't even going to be looked at for like a few hours, if not until the next day. So that's, that's not great. That's going to lead to a lot of people overriding. I've also talked to some nurses who work at this healthcare system and they said overriding used to be a thing that was happening absolutely all the time because of how slow things were in order to be verified by pharmacy. That has now changed, they said, but they reiterated time and time again how it was so unsafe because they did feel like they had to pull things over and over and over. Um so that's, yeah, not good. As we've seen with like the Redonda bot trial, you do not want to, um, which I have covered and I will leave a link, um, in the description. If you want to see that, uh, emergency overriding things leaves the door open to, um, all sorts of, all sorts of chaos. So it was ordered as an emergency override. Um, my, I would wonder why, um, as a nurse, you wouldn't question that if you're wandering into a vial, like if you uh, have only, you know, 10 vials is a lot of vials, uh, you know, when you're giving it, if you, again, this requires experience though, if you have not given fentanyl a lot, like to a lot of us, that would seem like very much common sense. Like this is an insane amount of fentanyl. 
if you didn't have a lot of experience, I guess you would maybe not know that that's a lot, but anytime you're opening a lot of vials, uh, let's just have that be a general learning thing. If you're opening a lot of vials of something other than maybe albumin, uh, it's probably weird. Like that's, that's probably not normal to be given all at the same time. And even with albumin, you're giving it like so stretched out. Um, but that's literally the only thing I could think of that like when you bring like a whole bucket into a room and you're like, I'm going to give you all of these. Um, mom and nurse says, I always learned if it's more than three vials, question it. It's a great rule. I, I would even go with two. I feel like I didn't give a lot of things that were even more than two. Um, so I do think nurses should have questioned it. It has also come out interestingly, um, that, the nurses, since he was the only physician on night shift and he was very personable with the nurses. So he was willing to teach them. And in response, a lot of people really, really liked him because they felt that he was very intelligent and was willing to talk to them. And therefore they did not want to really speak up or say much, uh, per different reports that I've read per and from different people I've talked to who work there. This one, it points out how, like how rare it can sometimes be to find a healthcare provider who's kind. And like that people would be like, yes, I'll lie about these crazy fentanyl things just because you're kind. Cause it's so rare red flag. Uh, but also hospital culture has a lot to do with it, where if no one is going to talk about it, you don't necessarily want to be the first one. And they probably didn't want to get backlash from talking about it. Cause it would probably be pretty clear maybe who was reporting that this was going on. Um, but none of that happened. Um, the hospital, from what I have heard, does not encourage a place where you can like question orders per the hospital, you know, like they don't, it's not like a open reporting thing where they're like, yes, come please ask questions. It sounds like that was pretty much a big, like kind of slap on the wrist thing that ended up happening. Um, so that sucks. Um, and one of the pharmacists, so sometimes if a few times it did go to the pharmacy, um, and one of the pharmacists did actually call the Dr. Husel and he was like, Hey, this has like one too many zeros. Are you sure? Like, did you just kind of like forget and add an extra zero? And Dr. Husel was like, no, like I meant that. And the pharmacist was like, okay. Um, you would think that maybe that would be when you would pause and be like, are you sure you didn't mean a hundred? You really meant a thousand. Um, so that probably should have been looked into, but, uh, yeah, overall it was an entire mess. The hospital did try to go back and cover up most of it by firing everyone. So when Dr. Husel was charged in November, um, they, the hospital pretty much said, all right, we're going to fire you. And then the CEO, uh, fired, I think 12 nurses, a couple pharmacists, a couple of the physicians got fired and, uh, like a bunch of administrators. And then the CEO resigned. So they pretty much just like got rid of everybody and said, well, like, let's try again next time. Um, so they obviously thought someone else was at fault as well. And they reported a lot of the nurses and the physicians and the pharmacists to their boards, but they did not, they were never charged criminally. So, which I don't think they should be charged criminally. Um, and we're going to kind of talk about how this relates to the Redon Devot case and other tr criminal cases in a little, I see the chat talking about like, well, is this still like, should this even be criminal? Um, and we're definitely going to talk about that um, because we probably all have different thoughts. Um, so why, why did this happen? Um, our next little question that I asked myself was, okay, so it's not an accident. Lots of people were involved. Um, why did this happen so many times before he was fired and investigated? And it's basically because the hospital sucks. <laughs> Is my conclusion. That's not, um, you know, allegedly I should probably say alleged like 12 million more times. Um, allegedly the hospital sucks. Um, yeah, they weren't looking for connections like that. Like I said, I think the culture was not that we were going to come out here and talk about this all the time. If you have a culture where things are just kind of hush hush and you fear for your job, uh, that if someone does come forward and say something and someone is well loved, it's really hard. It's easy as an outsider looking in to be like, I would definitely say something. But if you're in the situation and everyone loves this healthcare provider, and this is happening over years, and maybe you aren't necessarily working the times. I mean, I still think gossip would go around. Like, I cannot imagine someone is doing this and people don't, everyone doesn't know about it. Um, like, I just can't fathom that. But maybe we'll give you the benefit of the doubt and you're scared and you're new and you don't want to be that one person to say something and it's a punitive culture. 
who knows? So that's apparently how it got, how it happened was it needed 31 people before the hospital was like, all right, I guess this isn't going to stop. So we should probably like look into this. What was he charged with? So he was charged with murder. And then that was later dropped to attempted murder. Um, I think that it's odd that they charged him to be honest with murder instead of like reckless homicide, because they went with reckless homicide for Redonda Vaught and then Christiane Ganey, which I've covered that case too. Uh, that seems to be the criminal one versus like straight up murder. Cause murder is saying like you have the intent and he is going to claim that he didn't have the intent to kill them. He had their attempt to relieve their pain. Um, so I think reckless homicide, if they were going to go for something, I'm just surprised they didn't go with that one, but they chose murder and then attempted murder. And I think that had a, that played a lot into the jury's decision to then say he was not guilty because that's like a really hardcore thing to convict someone of and then given the setting where the patients were likely not going to live very long anyway to convict someone of murder for that, I just think probably sat poorly with a lot of the jurors. Um, and it's just odd to me that they didn't go with a different charge. But again, I also have mixed feelings about sh what should we be doing? Who should we be charging criminally? And all of that um, in terms of healthcare. This is bordering on that though, because this, I feel like is, um, this is interesting, um, in that it <laughs> like, yeah. So a lot of people are saying, um, he is not guilty. Um, he had a trial just like anybody else, no matter what they say now it's all over True. I mean, obviously no one is going to care about my corner of the internet and what I say about it. Um, but, and other people are saying, um, B page said he didn't murder, please watch the trial. So I have watched parts of the trial. Um, and let's talk about really quick how he, um, defended himself, like kind of talk about where he was coming from. And then we'll talk about all the charges and stuff like that. Cause that's what I want to have. It's like just respectful conversation here of like, was it, was it not all of that? So what did he say to kind of defend himself, right? Um, in order to defend himself, he said that he was advocating for his patients to not be in pain. So he was saying that he wanted to give them this dose so that they would be very comfortable when they were extubated. Um, and it, you know, that they would feel fine. Um, stated that coming... Um, after, and then the, in terms of like the jury, they said, uh, he was worried the lawyer that was arguing for him said, like, if you fight this, what you're basically going to do is be attacking palliative care and hospice and comfort care. Uh, so that's what he was kind of presenting to the jury was, Hey, if you don't let us do this, what are you doing with comfort care and palliative care? Which brings us to the next question of like, what even is uh, palliative care and comfort care? So that's end of life care with the goal, not being to get you better, but to get you comfortable. And often in palliative and comfort care, you have a lot more loosey goosey guidelines on what is allowed in terms of dosing. People are allowed to kind of do their own thing. Usually people do their own thing within a more normal scope of dosing, um, but it's not as regulated because you can say, oh, this is for end of life care. Hospice is the last six months. We call it um, comfort care in the hospital, usually when you're switching over. Um, but the focus is definitely on quality. So that's where he was going from. Um, I've also seen questions about like, is this, um, so if he's trying to just make people comfortable, like, was that his intent or was he actually trying to help people pass away? So like, is this physician assisted, uh, death and it's not. So in Ohio, that is illegal. Um, and that would be, even if it was, that's usually when you give the patients the ability to do that on their own. Um, you provide them the medication that will likely end their life. So this was not that this could never be like classified under that. This was him kind of going above and beyond in his eyes of making sure that they came off and they were comfortable. I think the important thing to remember here and to look at, um, is which they talked about in the trial was the patients would, have passed away anyway. This was not a case of, you know, the, um, you know, that they were mostly like, they were not expected to get better. However, they were arguing like, does that make it okay, um, to just overdose someone? 
Like, and I would say no, that it is not okay to just decide that you're going to give this dose that is way outside the recommended guideline treatment in order to like make someone comfortable. If they're not comfortable, that we usually say is like low and slow. So let's start with a smaller dose. See if they're, if they seem in any way agitated, give them more immediately, but you don't go in with your, you know, like your heaviest hitter initially and be like, I hope that like, well, at least I know, even if something bad happens, um, that, you know, I gave it my all. No, you kind of like work up in baby steps. Um, so I don't know what this kind of means as, um, in terms of like pal- what it means for palliative care, it would make me nervous that like, I hope they don't put more legislation on palliative care. Now that this has come out, I really do think that's a huge part of how the jury weighed into it was they didn't want that. No one wants to limit how we make people comfortable at the end of life. Um, and I think they weighed that ultimately with like, would these people have passed away anyway? Would Did they pass away quicker? I think absolutely, um, because we told their brains they don't need to breathe, but they would have, um, la- like, they could have lived minutes, days, hours, days, you know, I guess I switched those around, but like, it definitely hastened up um, the process. So I'm going to play devil's advocate, and then we will chat about kind of the case, what you guys think. I've seen a lot of different comments, um, different perspectives in the comments. So I'm excited to talk about that. Nikki, they were all DNR. Yeah. They were all, um, do not, so DNRs do not resuscitate. Um, they were all, they were being palliatively extubated. So they knew they were going to pass away. Um, they were being extubated so that they could pass, um, take their body off of life support and let them pass. Uh, the dose was just so much that it very much probably knocked the respiratory system out and never gave them chance for spontaneous respiration. Um, so the, um, devil's advocate would be why on earth, like, why would he even do this? Um, and I can see in his mind, right. Uh, I think one thing we do a lot in healthcare is sometimes just because we can do something, it doesn't mean that we should. Uh, and we have, sometimes we really torture people, you know, um, 90 year old grandma comes in, we make her a full code. Uh, that's horrifying. Um, you know, we keep people, um, sometimes you just see things, especially, uh, in, I saw it on my unit, um, in the ICUs. I'm sure you see it all the time where you're just like, we are not helping this person. We're keeping them alive because we can. And, uh, this is not, it's not good. It doesn't look good. We're pretty much torturing this person at this point. So I can see from his perspective, um, if he was thinking, I am just going to make this end, you know, I have the ability to, I can say it's for palliative care. Um, you know, that way they won't be air hungry. They won't be, um, you know, this will be quick. This will be painless. Um, I can see how he could look at it from a compassionate perspective. I don't know him. I don't know how he was coming from it, but I can absolutely put myself in the position of seeing how he wouldn't want people to suffer, how he's maybe seen people come off of a ventilator and just struggle to breathe. If you've ever seen someone struggling to breathe at the end of their life, it is horrifying. Um, and a thing of nightmares. It's tragic for the patients. It's tragic for the patient, uh, their family. It's awful. Um, so I could see how he would maybe think I am going to alleviate that. Um, the question then comes into mind of, but is that legal? Um, so that's why I think this case actually gets super duper tricky. Um, because I personally, I think what he did was wrong because he did not inform the families. Uh, and he was taking it kind of into his own hands to be like, Hey, I'm going to do this. Um, without having the telling, cause he didn't tell the families that, Hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give this dose. It's way higher than normal, but, um, you know, I think it's going to have them pass quickly. And that's not informed consent on the family's part. And that's not, that's not okay. He was making the decision instead of having it be a group decision. 
but I can also see on the other side, uh, wanting someone to just go in a peaceful way. So that's kind of my, the way I see the two sides about it. Things I think that we can do, um, in terms of how can we allow this to change our own practice is one being very clear in our own lives and with our lives of people we love is getting an advanced directive and having these conversations early so that it's like, Hey, if things aren't looking good, I want this to happen. You know, like, um, totally like, I don't want to be on a ventilator long-term. I don't want X, Y, and Z so that maybe you're not in the situation where your family is having to like make all these choices and palliatively extubate you. Um, because say you're chronically ill. I had these conversations with my patients all the time. I'm like, do you ever want to be on a ventilator if you're really, really ill and then have to have your family make the decision of taking you off of it? Um, having those conversations with your loved ones. So you're all on the same page. That is going to be very helpful so that you're, maybe not in the situation in the first place. It's no one's fault that these patients were not in these, um, that they were like, I'm not in any way trying to blame them. I'm saying like going forward, this is what I would do if I, you know, were you, uh, having the conversations with your family members, if you are, um, or your patients, if you work in healthcare, letting people know what you would want. Um, and that's going to keep you out of, the conversation, um, and asking permission. If you are someone who is having that conversation, whether it's your family member or you are a healthcare provider, don't just say, I want to talk to you about healthcare, um, advanced directives. <laughs> like what happens if you go into a coma? Um, the way I do it with my patients, uh, was just asking permission. So like, Hey, um, it doesn't have to be today, but at some point in the future, I would really like to have a, an uncomfortable conversation with you or a conversation that may be uncomfortable. I want to talk about end of life and what you would like done if you were taken to the hospital or something happened to you that, uh, if we don't intervene would likely lead to the end of your life and you passing away and dying using the word dying, asking permission again, having them be able to come into an appointment or a setting, where they're very aware that this is going to be happening. All of that makes it a lot less awkward. Uh, maybe we can have a whole conversation about that sometime, um, but it's much less awkward. And I have had so many other, so many people come in and tell me after, like, I'm so glad we had that conversation. I knew exactly what to do when X, Y, or Z happened. Uh, and then the last thing would be, um, what if uh, you are a nurse in this situation um, and you are seeing really sketchy things, uh, on your unit and you don't feel like you can stand up and in the moment be like, Hey, this is really messed up. Like, why are you ordering this in this crazy dose of something? Or why are you doing this? Um, one always feel like you, like, I, I don't want to say like, Oh, you should just stand up. Cause I don't think that's realistic. I think it's fairly intimidating a lot of the times, uh, especially as a newer nurse, um, or healthcare provider to call out your peers or someone who, uh, you see as like giving you, you know, like if you're a nurse and there's a physician, like you're, there's usually a power imbalance there that's perceived, even if it's not real, um, go and tell someone else later, you know, or let an administrator know, send a incident report, um, let them know that something is going on. Um, even if it's like anonymous, you know, just like speak up and, um, let them know if that makes sense. So those are my thoughts on it. Now I'm going to go back and let's see some of the comments of all of you. Um, and we can discuss, cause I know some of you think, uh, let me see if I can do another, let me do another poll here really quick on the YouTubes. Oh, where's this one and that one. And let's do this one. Do you think he is guilty or he should have been charged with murder? Do you think he should be criminally charged? I don't, um, uh, I don't know if I have like an absolute, like, Hey, I definitely think, I think if we're criminally charging him, I wouldn't do it for murder. I think I would definitely do it. I don't even know if I would though. Like, I don't know. That's the thing is if it was a different situation where patients were not going to pass away anyway, I don't think it's condonable. I think he should lose his medical license because he is not practicing in a way that is that maybe in our minds, maybe in our minds, it's ethical, but on paper it is not. Um, 
because he was making decisions for people without their family's consent. Um, but I don't, again, I do not think, I think there were so many different people involved. Like how did the hospital let him get away with it for so long? Other people said yes and said, this is fine. I think it's a systems issue that he was allowed to get to this point and criminalizing it. I am not sure even though it is horrible that some of these people's life could have been cut short, I'm not sure that criminalizing this once again is the way to get the message across because now people are once again going to be fearful, at least in my mind, of what if I give someone, um, you know, the dose and then something terrible happens, uh, you know, palliative care has some protections in it, but what if that changes? Um, the whole thing is just like, it's rough and I'm not sure. So I, I welcome all of your commentary. Um, Brittany McDonald, um, thanks for being a channel member. Uh, she gets the fun little badge thing. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, the thing that is odd to me is the decision to do this overnight as an emergency, just like, you know, when you're doing this is wrong and, um, and trying to hide it. Agreed. I think he did it at night. Uh, I mean, sometimes I think palliative excavations happen at night, but why are you overriding you? I mean, he had to be overriding and acting like it was an emergency in order to get this dose approved again and again. Um, and then shameless plug, if you want to become a channel member, um, you can do that down below. There's different tiers. It's fun. Um, at least I hope it'll be fun. <laughs> I'm working on having it be fun. Um, it's yeah, it's just a fun, different way to support me, or you can like, and share and, you know, comment and do all the things that the YouTube gods love. Um, and I appreciate you for any kind of support anyone has. Uh, Amanda Forrester said, so Redonda goes to jail for one med error, but a male doctor overdoses 30 patients, four patients and let get let go. So I think that's where a lot of double standards are coming in with this too, is like, oh, Redonda bought, you know, she gave a horrible med error and she is her, she was convicted of reckless homicide, I think. Um, and like, why aren't we, why is this? And then um, Christian Ganey, made a horrible error. Someone passed away, was convicted. So like, and this was like, those were one-time things and these were like repeat things. So I think that calls into question a lot. Like we really need to standardize how we're approaching, you know, in all of the situations, we have a lot to learn from them, but we really need to standardize that approach and not be like, Oh, you silly nurses, you're going to go and be criminally charged, but Oh, you doctor, it's fine. It's fine. Um, cause you make the hospital a lot of money because nurses, uh, I mean, I would argue that we save money because we're like helping patients and doing all of that, but nurses, you have to pay and physicians bring in money. Um, mom and nurse says it's, I swear. Cause he's a doctor. I mean, I agree. I'm not a pain doctor. Um, but I'm no pain doctor, no matter what you do, you're screwed. Or I think you're talking, um, Amar about, uh, let me see about pain. And this brings up a whole different conversation about like pain meds. Cause then he says they want us to give 800 milligrams of ibuprofen, not even tramadol, which is weak and does nothing. We've almost gone backwards in terms of pain medicine. And this is a whole different topic for a different day that I would love to talk about, um, is now we don't prescribe any kind of pain medicine, but that's not really, that's a different conversation from end of life because end of life, we pretty much do. Um, spirit media said the intense MD on YouTube is going to make a video about it. And she's an intensivist. Oh, perfect. That'll be really interesting to watch. Um, uh, do you, we talked about that. That was one dose. Um, Elliot said epic warning. Are you sure you want to dispense patients? Uh, bark meow. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's it's a giant no. Palliative extubations are always timed. Make sure his family is there. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, kind of going back to Redonda, if you're going to charge one, like this is kind of how we have to approach it. No one's going to learn if we're just criminally charging everyone. Also, it's not fair if we're not applying the same rigor in a case that seems so much more intentional. Um, David said not guilty was absolutely the right call. If you watched the entire trial, you would know that there was no way they had no way of proving his intent. Um, so that's when I kind of go back and think like, if they were going to do it at all, why wouldn't they do reckless homicide? Because you're right. Like they have no way of showing that he wanted to end their lives. And I think even if he did, it would have probably been out of compassion, uh, not out of like meanness. Um, but reckless would have more just been like, Hey, why were you giving a dose that was so outside the norms of guidelines? Um, and like I said, I'm very convicted on, I really probably 
don't think, I mean, I don't think murder, I don't know. It's a mess. Um, uh, nurse Scott said, as we have seen in so many cases, this te- intent is not required for a crime to be committed. Um, and yes, we have seen those in the last two with those nurses who did not intend for their patient to pass, but that was the result. Um, mom and said, if it was negligent or reckless homicide, I feel like it would have been convicted. And that, um, I kind of agree. I think might be, we would have looked at it differently, but I don't even know. What do you guys think? Like, is that something that should even be convicted or should this be more of like, Hey, let's turn this into, you know, your license is revoked and go at it more civilly. Like I've talked about, I wish they went to civil penalties for the nurses where we can learn from the situation and your life isn't, you know, you're not criminally charged. Uh, David said they only charged murder and then a lesser included charge of attempted murder, negligent homicide and reckless homicide was not considered in the case. Yeah, I saw that. And that's why I was confused. Like why it wasn't like, I thought murder and attempted murder were very bold because I believe with those in Ohio, you have to show intent, uh, which is going to be really hard. Nurse Scott said intent. Yes. Is a murder charge, but no intent can be criminal negligence. Yeah. So a different charge would have been again, odd that they chose murder. Um, it was, uh, nurse Scott again said it was the Redonda Vaught case where the charge was criminal negligent homicide. Yes. Thank you. I couldn't remember exactly what hers was. I was like, Ugh. um, and her trial, they're going to be doing her sentencing, I think in like 10, two weeks, maybe. So I'll keep you updated on all of that. Um, let me see. I heard that this VVCC said, I heard of this case. And after looking into this and thinking thoroughly, well, if I was one of those patients in those conditions, I would be glad to have a doctor to end that pain. And I think this brings up a good conversation of we really need to reevaluate end of life care and how we humanely treat people at the end of their life. Right. So I don't necessarily think that if that having things like this should be bad, as long as the patient and the family, if the patient is unavailable to have that conversation again, advanced directive is a good idea is on board with it. You know what I mean? If the family had said, please, like when, like, please, when they come off, like, I just want it to be quick and painless, very different conversation than saying, Hey, we're going to take them off and see how they do. Um, we inspect them to pass away, but, uh, they don't know you're giving a mega dose of something very, very different. But I really do think like we are kinder to our pets than we are to our people. And that's really sad. Um, Nurse Scott said, BBCC, any doctor would help your loved one at the end of life. This doctor really accelerated the dying process beyond what was ethical. Again, yeah, so there was no informed consent there. Uh, He was kind of just going for it. Um, I understand the legality, uh, but the reality is most people would rather have the death process accelerated in those cases. I'm just talking for myself and those I've known in hospice. Yeah. And I agree. I think I've had, I've seen it both on the inpatient side and the outpatient. A lot of people would just like a quicker end. Um, but since, but that's a decision again for them to make, um, Amanda Forrester said, just as an aside, this is a really good point. This kind of stuff is why people don't trust healthcare. Yeah. I mean, you can't really blame them. Um, and then Amanda said, I see both sides and both sides are tragic. I agree. I think that's a, a good way to explain that. Uh, maybe the nurse Scott again, maybe the central question is what is the standard? What do most end of life doctors do? And was this so far from the standard that it's unethical? So they did have other palliative care people weigh in, um, and then comment on the case after it was closed. And they said this was far outside the scope of normal, even in opiate tolerant patients that again, they probably would have given doses of, you know, if recommended as 50 to hundred, maybe they would have gone 200, maybe, maybe 300, 400, uh, but to go so high as a thousand, they said was just, that would not be something they would ever do. Um, please everyone, this is Emily Martinez said, please everyone fill out an advanced directive and tell your family members what you want. Yes. And get that from your loved ones. Cause you never want to be having, uh, those conversations or a guessing when you're already going through something so traumatic, like if it's a parent or a loved one who's passing, that's enough on, you don't need to add, like, I think this is what they would want. Uh, nurse Scott said in my legal class, the first thing the instructor told us is that not everything that's illegal is unethical and not everything that's unethical is illegal. Yes. Yes. That's, those are very, very mixed. And I think that comes into play here. Um, 
This is Joe P says, this is an example of doctors abusing their power. However, I think what he was doing was helping people pass faster and with less pain. Doctors have too much power for sure. Um, Oh, I think this like kind of sums up a lot of how I feel like he's getting away with it because he does have a lot of power in the situation. I think, um, you know, if a nurse was doing this or even a nurse practitioner, I'm not sure this would be looked on the same way. Uh, you know, if a nurse wanted to give a little bonus dose of something and it was found out, um, obviously nurses don't have prescriptive power, but I just think it wouldn't be looked at the same. Um, but again, I don't think it's necessarily bad, but it's not what we do. And it wasn't informed consent. So ugh. Jan Black said, was it kind of normalized over the time period? That's what he does. Then that's how we do it. Not saying it's okay. However, um, I've seen it. I have seen that too, where things just kind of become what's normal, even if that's not technically normal. Uh, so I don't know. I haven't worked there. It sounded like from what I have heard is that he kind of was just very well loved and even though people knew it was not right, they did it. You know what I mean? Cause he kind of took you under your wing, made you feel special, uh, made you feel like, Oh, he's listening to me. He's teaching me. Um, it can be a very difficult situation. Um, especially when everyone on the unit feels the same way. It's hard to be that one person that stands up and says something different. Mom and nurse said, I thought the standard was Ativan more and morphine for dying patients add scopolamine patch for the rattles when they start. So there's kind of like a, like a rattly shaky breath and scopolamine. Uh, it's a patch and it goes behind your ear. Or it goes usually behind your ear and it helps dry up secretions. So that's why they give people um, the scopolamine, uh, Ativan for like anxiety, um, morphine for pain and for the air hunger. Um, and I, my, I think this might be institutionally based. I know they do give, um, I have only ever given morphine and Ativan and scopolamine, just like you, um, mostly I think, yeah, that was our cocktail was those three for end of life. But after talking with a few people on Instagram, they said that their hospital uses, um, fentanyl. And I was looking at different research articles and using fentanyl is very supported in the literature. Um, but just at slower, smaller doses. Lanoka said the problem with pulling his license is there are layers of licensed staff and administrators that could have intervened a slippery slope should other staff have their license pulled to intent is key. Yeah. And that's why they're, uh, having every, like they were having the nurses licenses looked at. There's other physicians who knew about it. They are pulling the pharmacists who didn't put a stop to it. They're looking at all of those. Um, Jeremiah Rourke said, I have friends, fellow nurses who lost their jobs over this sounds like, um, there were people dying of dying with no family. I don't think he gets to play God, but there's definitely another side to the story. Um, I didn't work with him, but I would have no trouble declining giving the medication. Like I said, unfortunately, I know friends who got in trouble for following orders. Oh, so yeah, it sounds like, um, again, like, especially if you don't have family or someone like with you, like I get, I understand. I have seen horrible, horrible, horrible deaths um, that went on for far too long, um, that you just wished, you know, you could just do, you know, do something. Um, and I think we do it all the time in medicine where we just, you know, there are a lot of really horrible things that we do to people. But again, the issue comes down to, it was not informed consent. The family did not consent. So what do we do from here? And also, like you said, it was a huge, so many people messed up within this. Um, yikes. All right. Hang on one second. I'm going to take it. Someone told me last time they were like, um, when you take a sip, when you need to cough, drink more water. Cause I was doing like one. So I'm working on it. I'm taking your feedback. I'm trying to be more streamlined and I'm trying like give you the narrative and then explain, I'm taking your feedback. I'm trying. So if you have any feedback, let me know. I'm trying to make these more, you know, followable, more streamlined, more enjoyable. Um, I'm going to drink more water. <laughs> I'm doing what you tell me. Um, let me see. Uh, sometimes patients bring it up. And this is from Jeremiah, who was like in the know. He knew the people. Um, but to be honest, it's not often people are tired of talking about it, at least not often people are tired. So people like do bring it up. Um, 
B. LePage said, so she, uh, he did these at night and in some cases because the daytime physician already spoke with the families and they wanted to wait for other family to arrive um, out of town and then it fell into his shift. Yeah. Um, I think that, I think like we had said, and nighttime is a lot more peaceful for palliative, um, extubation, um, in like in general. So I totally understand why it happened at night. The thing that I don't understand is why it was emergently ordered and then overridden. Uh, that is odd. And then like verbal orders versus even putting into the computer and having it be overridden. Because I know if you put it in the computer, it would look real odd. Like you can't go into a computer and just type in a crazy dose of something and have it overridden. That's very complicated from a prescriber's end, uh, because I have done that. I've like gone in and tried to manually override things, um, for like little things, not for big things. Like, Hey, I want to do this dose, which is like lower than what you recommend normally. And you know, it wouldn't let me. So going in and doing a huge dose like that, like the emergence of it, I guess with like, why didn't he go through the approved channels? That is what makes me be like, Oh, like you knew, you knew something was wrong. Um, why do you keep saying his family wasn't informed? Um, where are you getting this info? Because it's inaccurate. So I was getting the info that his, his family, the families were informed that their loved one was being extubated, but they were not told I'm going to give a way higher dose than is guideline recommended. And that should be a conversation. Um, at least I have not seen, I have seen from the family members and watching the families testify that that's what they were surprised by. It was like, no one told them about that part. So I might be totally wrong. Like I said, I watched chunks of the trial, but in no way, all of it. Um, and to me, it just looked like they knew that they were going to be extubated. They knew they would not live long, but they did not know. They knew they would be given comfort, but not like, Hey, I'm going to give you a dose that's way past what's normal. And that's something that as a provider, I would feel responsible to give, you know what I mean? Like if I'm going to be doing something that is in any, I like, I explain things no matter what, but especially if what I am doing is a little bit off the beaten path, I'm going to explain that to you and say, Hey, I think this could work. I think we could also try this. Technically it's not in the guidelines. You know, this isn't really how we roll, but we could try it. This could happen. This could greatly shorten the amount of time that your family member lives. I think, so that's where I'm coming from was not, um, that's kind of how, um, I look at it. Uh, Fallon said, making you feel special sounds like grooming so that he can do what you want. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm going to educate you. I'm going to do all of this, um, you know, and see where it gets us. Uh, you know, that's yikes. That is pretty much textbook grooming. Cause then you don't want to go against the person who's like love bombing. Yeah. Um, Mom and nurse said, if that was a verbal order, I would think to ask the provider first to enter the order. I wouldn't be comfortable with that. And I work in a traumatical surgical where we use paralytics. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's where maybe like he was friendly with them and he, they really liked him is from what I have heard from people who worked there, um, that they then didn't question it, which leads us into a whole, a whole different mess of you cannot let how much you like other people overshadow your clinical judgment. Like listen to those alarm bells. Even if you don't really know, like, Oh, maybe this dose sounds like sort of kind of wrong. Listen to your alarm bells. Okay. Listen to your alarm bells. Um, somebody asked, is he still practicing? I can't find the question. Um, no. So he had his, uh, license, revoked by the medical board, if I understand correctly. And then he did not, or maybe it just lapsed. The medical board, I think told him like, no, you can't do anything. And then it lapsed. He's not, he doesn't have a license at this point. Um, the hospital fired him. And, uh, from my understanding from his lawyer or some other lawyer, they do not expect that he will ever practice medicine again because he has so many lawsuits that are civil lawsuits coming at him. Um, end of life care this is from Phelan said end of life care is never easy for us in healthcare families and it never should be. The conversation should always be had, especially in the moment. Yeah. So I'm all about, um, just having informed consent. This is what you can expect. This is normal. Um, you know, even if they're going to be going in a little bit of a different way, uh, 
like just informing people about it so that it's not, um, that who said, Kate said that, uh, shouldn't be a big overdose. That's not palliative. Yeah. So that's kind of what it comes down to was, you know, if, if you've had, you know, maybe we should have a system where you are allowed to say, Hey, if it comes down to this, like, give me the biggest dose you have, like, and then pull me off. But that's not the society we live in. I personally think we should do that. Um, but it should be known. It should be a very informed thing. All of that. Um, uh, let me see any history. Um, Lenoke, any history that the MD was really trying to provide sincere palliative care to ease end of life? That is what he is saying. Um, and I think there's a good argument for that. Having seen, I'm sure working in the ICU, especially he has seen some truly horrific, horrific, um, passings that he didn't want someone else to experience. Uh, but again, that comes down to our other issue. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Everybody who has, um, given other insight again, like I have never worked in the ICU. So this was something that when I was looking, I was like, I want to talk about it, but I, I hope there's people that can offer other insight because I am not the authority on everything. Maybe, you know, despite my, <laughs> I wish, um, let me see. I think we got pretty much all of the questions. Do, 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 do. Um, I want to go back and make sure I didn't miss anything epic. Um, da, 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 da. I'd be curious, um, B. LePage, if he informed the families that um, I saw somewhere, I think that she had said that he had had a bad patient experience where they needed, um, like a bigger dose than normal. And so that probably like affected him into thinking like, maybe he would do this way, but like, did he tell the patients families that they, he was going to be giving a bigger dose than was recommended? That's really what it, I think it all would come down to. Okay, friends. Thank you so much for being here. Those are my thoughts. If you have any other questions, I feel free to continue the conversation in the comments. Um, let me know if there's any other cases you want me to pretend I'm an expert on. Uh, always happy to do that and do some research. Um, and thank you to everyone who came and joined us today so that we could have a really well-rounded discussion. Um, yeah. And just leave your thoughts in the comments below. I think it's interesting to have these difficult, you know, conversations, uh, but we can all learn a little bit of something. Um, Caitlin said, I don't understand why we're continuing to drag this man through the mud after he was deemed not guilty in a court of law. This is a more complex topic than can be summarized on a YouTube live just so we can talk about it and learn from it. Cause I think there are things we can learn from it. It raises different conversations. Um, I think, I don't think we've only dragged his name through them. I think we've kind of given context to a situation. I know I felt much more favorably to him actually after reading about it. Cause when I heard about it, I was like, what a garbage human. And after hearing about it, I was like, and really thinking about it for a few days, I was like, I can see why someone would do this. Um, I can see why um, going forward. So again, the intent is never to drag anyone. It's just to bring up these conversations so we can talk about more things like why don't we treat people humanely at the time of death? Why aren't we, um, you know, what safety things can we do? If you're a nurse in this situation, let's talk through it. If you're a family member in this situation, what can we do to avoid things like this in the future? Um, all of that. So sorry if it comes off, like I'm dragging someone through the mud. That's certainly not my intention here. Um, mama nurse said, where's the best place to notify you about the case we want to cover either on Instagram or, um, on, here, uh, nurse Liz, YouTube at gmail.com nurse Liz, YouTube is probably, if you email me is the best way. Cause I am horribly behind on my Instagram messages. So you can hit me there. All right, friends. Thanks for hanging out today. I hope you have a beautiful rest of the day. Remember that you are not alone. You are enough and you can do hard things. Bye friends. <laughs>